Cause I'm the data guy, making bikes fly high, diving deep into the data, reaching for the sky, from ETLs to data lakes and pipelines that don't break. Tune in, hang on, and let's make data great. Hey y'all, data guy here. So I just got back from an amazing Airflow Summit up in beautiful Toronto. Uh, and so I wanted to make a quick video for you, those of you that weren't lucky enough to be able to attend uh, to just kind of break down what happened, what some of the general themes were, some of the biggest announcements, um, and really just talk about, you know, how it's got me reinvigorated and really juiced about the future of Airflow by kind of seeing this, all of the different things that people are using it for nowadays. And so this was also the first in-person Airflow Summit. Uh, and the open source community really showed out. You had tons of different people from lots of different industries, from you know banking, finance, all the way over to you know companies like Reddit. Uh, you had Snowflake database providers. You had Astronomer there. Uh, that's why I was able to attend. Um, you know, so the best way to run managed Airflow there, and big variety of talk tracks and even expertise with Airflow. You know, you had some people that were there to really explore it, thinking about maybe starting to adopt it uh, within their organizations and people that have been running it within their organizations since it almost was incepted back in 2014. Um, so there's a real range of material. So no matter what your experience level was with Airflow, uh, I can almost guarantee that you got something out of it um, because there were over a hundred sessions you had, I think, you know, Obviously, with over 100 sessions, you had over 100 speakers, and there was just such a variety of different use cases and things there that I'm going to try and go and start to go into now. And so, what I really the first biggest theme I think, and what kind of encompasses all of the other themes at the conference was how Airflow has evolved really so much since those early days at Airbnb as you know just kind of a scheduling tool, a better way than Cron to you know schedule your data pipelines. And it's really now grown, you know, not only just the core Airflow project, you know, it's become more robust, ready for enterprise, able to scale better. It's got better scheduling APIs, uh, ways to do dynamic DAGs and dynamic tasks that aren't so hacky. And the UI also has undergone a ton of improvement just to make it not only easier to use, but more powerful in that it, because it has such a solid foundation, you're able to bring in all of these external systems into Airflow and really use it as that single pane of glass to monitor the modern data stack. Um, and so some of the things that we talked about at the conference, um, you know, some of those tools that people were talking about using were things like Cosmos, which is a way to uh, render DBT workflows within Airflow. Um, so you don't actually need to use uh, the DBT cloud. You don't need to use the UI there. You can just use your uh, Airflow environment as a UI for your DBT uh, models workflows and incorporate that within the context of your larger data pipeline. You also have a lot of organizations that were developing tooling for non-technical users. So a great example of this was FAIR. They developed a completely non-technical, no technical expertise needed feature engineering platform where someone that has no idea even what to do with ML can develop a feature engineered data set that is ready to be used in an ML pipeline just by filling out three parameters. And they don't even know Airflow is running under the hood. They just select those from an external menu and the API triggers everything behind the scenes. Um, and so a lot of use cases like that and a lot of the themes that were you know, democratizing Airflow and using Airflow to democratize as the backend to democratize you know, things like ML to non-technical users. So you really can you know, expand the impact that those innovations can have within your organization. Um, and then building on, you know, with ML as well, you had a ton of different people talking about, you know, how they're using uh, Airflow as the center of their ML ops stack. And so what I heard to a few times, and I'll go into uh, actually an example of this with Ask Astro, but Airflow really as the tool that is at the core of training for LLM models, uh, but not just LLMs for even micro ML models. Um, you know, some people even had customer specific ML models that they were using with Airflow to power it all because Airflow can handle the scale that comes with all of the, with, you know, training on large amounts of data or training large amounts of models. And, you know, they need to constantly retrain and update um, to improve the quality of those predictions as well. Um, and then you also had on top of this,
We also saw a lot of people that are doing things like data-driven scheduling, where as you can see here, instead of a time-based scheduling, you're actually scheduling based on the creation or update uh, to a data set that you're expecting. Um, and some of the workflows this enables is, you know, having teams share data sets between them without having to sync up their schedules. So one team can produce a data set and a second team can consume that data set whenever it's created without needing to monitor, hey, that this uh, upstream data set has actually been created, uh, which creates a lot less rigidity and fragility within your data architecture. And then in kind of keeping with this theme of, you know, reducing rigidity, spread, breaking up monolithic DAGs. And, you know, so now instead of having one DAG that is processing the data and then also training the ML model, you can have data where scheduling where, hey, one DAG is going to produce this data set, then another DAG is going to consume that model and then with that or consume that data to train a model. And then that also opens up, hey, now multiple uh, downstream DAGs can consume that same model, can be scheduled off of it. And we don't have to just create parallel DAGs of mimicking that processing workflow as well. Um, and then there's also building on top of that data mesh architecture. So just as you're you know, breaking up monolithic DAGs into many smaller DAGs, you also have a lot of teams um, like Kiwi that were, and I'll talk about some of the real use cases later, but are basically using instead of you know a couple large airflow instances many smaller airflow instances that are all chained together uh with kind of a hypervisor layer on top of it and so that's where you know having a management layer having uh some kind of control plan on top of all of your airflow environments allows you to do things like that you know have up to hundreds of airflow environments running for each for a particular use case each for a particular team so that everything is logically isolated everything can run efficiently and everything can have access to the resources that they need and then one of my favorite announcements uh, from one of my teammates, Julian Leneve, uh, he and a whole team with him have built Ask Astro, which is a essentially using that same uh, Andreessen Horowitz provided, you know, example LLM architecture to create a chatbot or an AI that is trained on Airflow questions to solve Airflow problems. And, you know, for the purpose of having a dedicated place to go and ask some of those common Airflow troubleshooting problems ask you questions about, hey, best practices, so you don't have to constantly pour through documentation and just reducing that timed resolution um, or time to moving forward uh, with your DAGs. So you can ask questions like, hey, you know, I want to refactor my DAGs using Tassel API. Um, so I can ask it that. And then and then after a few seconds, you'll get a you know response like this. And then it's also saves popular responses. So you can go look through them um, and you can kind of see the sources that it used as well. Uh, so if you want to go reference the actual source documentation, you can. And this is really great because if you've tried to use ChatGPT for Airflow problems, it's trained on only Airflow information before 2021. And there's been a ton of updates since then because that speed of development has only continued to increase. You know, now we're on a quarterly release schedule um, and there's just a lot of new features that are coming down the pipeline and that have really already come out like data where scheduling, like dynamic tasks, um, that have enabled Airflow to be applicable to all these new use cases like LLMs, like uh, AI as they become available. And so now kind of switching over to, hey, what are some of the real world people that are actually putting these use cases into practice? Um, and one of my favorites is the team over at Kiwi. Uh, and so Philippe and Stanislav were kind enough to cut fly all the way from Europe to come join us at the conference. Uh, and they had a really interesting talk about how they were able to break down you know, from one monolithic Airflow instance that was had 30 teams with 500 DAGs active, over 3 million tasks. And so breaking that down now into many smaller instances of Airflow to have that data mesh architecture. So now individual teams can have their own Airflow environments. Um, and then they really talk about, hey, you know, how are they able to maintain all of those DAG, the observability, the centralized dependency management, um, and stakeholder management that came with the model like the Airflow instance and still maintaining that as they move to a data uh, mesh architecture and all the benefits that gave. Um, and they even were able to talk about how they have a passwordless Airflow experience now for some of their devs um, where they're automatically authenticating in using their existing um, Okta and uh, GCP workload identity uh, flows. So they're doing a lot of cool stuff at really large scale because they need to process so much data because they have so many different teams, you know, they're really pushed to uh, test the boundaries of what's possible with Airflow and identify, you know, things like, hey, we can actually have a more efficient Airflow environment by implementing a data mesh architecture.
And another really great talk um, was from FAIR. And FAIR talked about how they were able to create a democratized ML feature store framework at scale. And essentially what this means is that they were able to create a framework on top of Airflow that allowed non-technical users to basically enter a few parameters, uh, enter the data set that they wanted to feature engineer, and have this framework bring that information to Airflow, feature engineer that data set, and then return it as a feature engineered ML ready data set for them to use then in downstream workflows. And so this enables data scientists that, you know, to define new features, backfill them using dynamic DAGs um, and bring, and so this is something that they wouldn't have been able to do before easily because they didn't have an easy way to feature engineer data sets and figure out, hey, what are the relevant features within these data sets? Um, and then, you know, dynamic DAGs came in as well, allowing them to backfill them based again on just a couple of different parameters um, and not need to actually go in and understand all the DAG code. And so what this has allowed FAIR to do is really extend the power of ML, extend the power of AI to users that might not have had access to it before, uh, empowering their data scientists to uh, do more and keep updating their predictions, keep iterating, keep improving their models. And it also, as they continue on, so now they have you know feature engineers, uh, data sets that are ready for consumption. Their next step is they're building actually a ML platform on top of that, where similarly to before, a non-technical user can come in, you know, they can get their feature engineer data set based on the data they want to generate predictions on, then put it in their new or their soon to be coming uh, democratized ML platform, have that generate predictions on it that are human readable and require no expertise in the ML space. Um, and I think you can already imagine some of the possibilities that that can bring up, you know, as you get these non-traditional users coming in and getting these predictions and then using them to improve uh, their own work. Another really cool talk I heard was from the Bloomberg team. Um, and so if you've ever worked with the Bloomberg terminal, you know that there is just absolutely insane amounts of data that go into it. And I didn't know this before, but Bloomberg is using Airflow to manage and orchestrate the data flow from all those different applications and to, into Bloomberg terminal functions. And to do this, they have over they have 1500 dynamic DAGs that are constantly scaling up to adjust, you know, as data sets uh, change from these source systems because they're pulling from such a diverse rate. You know, you need to have like things like oil yield curve uh, all the way down to, you know, the temperature in Brazil. Um, Bloomberg just has an insane amount of data on that. And so dynamic DAGs allow them to adjust as those data sets change um, adjust as those sources change without manual intervention. And so this is a really cool example of implementing some of the latest features in Airflow um, at scale. And they had a really good talk about you know, how they were able to do that um, and also build a configuration system on top of that to allow non-engineers to actually start um, building new DAGs based off of that framework, just saying, hey, you know, I want to connect to this data set, I want to pull this data out of it and bring it into Bloomberg. They can do that and then Bloomberg uh, dynamic DAG generation system will generate a DAG uh, tailored for whatever that data set needs to be extracted. Um, so really cool stuff um, there on, you know, again, leveraging latest features at scale. There's also a lot of great talks about, you know, from companies like Pepsi, that you know, we're really sets around, hey, how Airflow has allowed them to easily integrate data quality checks within their existing uh, data pipelines. So in this case, they actually are also using data mesh. Um, so it's a really decentralized uh, development system for processing data, running data quality checks, using things like grid expectations to maintain those data quality as just a regular part of your Airflow pipelines. And so this is kind of what I was talking about earlier, where because Airflow is so extensible to so many different tools, you can bring all of those different tool sets into your pipelines and gain new capabilities within how you process data because Airflow makes it so easy to incorporate them. And then some of the other really cool innovations kind of tangential, tangential to the data quality space is there's a lot of new innovations coming around open lineage and bringing open lineage a little more closely coupled with Airflow so that, uh, you know, the event system within Airflow and how it manages tasks just naturally uh, emits open lineage run events so that then that lineage information is available to correct, collect rather than needing to, you know, install lineage agents into every task or every operator that you're trying to run to actually collect that information, um, which has kind of prevented a lot of lineages adoption enterprise. But 
as a lot of these issues were addressed, you know, I met a lot of people from the open lineage team there. They are, or it's becoming more and more prevalent. You know, people are starting to bring lineage into production systems on Airflow. Um, and, you know, because of all the great capabilities that lineage can offer, you know, having a full view of exactly how your data is transformed as it flows through your systems can be really powerful, not only just, you know, for fault monitoring, but also for readability, for training new users on how data flows through systems as they're onboarded. So really excited to see how this kind of continues to develop here. Um, and just in general, you know, a really cool uh, kind of future thing to look for, for from Airflow. And so I could keep going through all of these different sessions and kind of talking about, you know, the cool, I mean, there, there was just so much content here. It was really incredible. I believe uh, these videos will start to be made available on this page. I'm not sure about if you need to take it for anything, uh, but I really recommend you at least go here and, you know, find some of the most interesting topics and watch them because there were just such a wealth of content there from real users using Airflow. And it's really just giving me a lot of hope and confidence, you know, in Airflow's continued relevance within the data space. And so here, I just kind of wanted to summarize with just some takeaways and, you know, an eye towards the future of where I see Airflow going. Um, so number one, Airflow is not only at the center of driving ML stacks, uh, training large language models. Um, Airflow is also has is starting to have a lot of tooling come out, you know, like Ask Astro, where, you know, you can train your almost like an airflow expert, an in-house airflow buddy. So you don't have to become an airflow expert to get the power of airflow. Um, and also you just enable like people who are airflow experts to get that much more and to really start embedding, using airflow to embed AI and ML operations throughout their organization and using airflow to manage all of the different systems, all the different data points that that requires. Um, and then almost in tandem with that, you know, I think there were over at least three talks about companies moving from monolithic airflow architectures of one massive airflow environment that you toss a ton of compute at, you know, you make sure it's super high powered into more of a data mesh architecture where you have many smaller airflow environments, you know, you, so you can segment four different teams, four different use cases. You don't run into the dependency conflicts of monolithic airflow environments. Each team has, you know, their own securely isolated work while still enabling cross-team con collaboration and able to connections between all of those different airflow environments because of, you know, the richness of the airflow API, because of all the different tooling on top of airflow that allows it to, you know, adapt to different use cases um, while, you know, still maintaining kind of a central layer of control over it. Um, and so you don't gain all the benefits of decentralization without losing uh, any of the capabilities or processing power that might've come with the monolithic airflow environment. And not only that, it makes it less of, you know, hey, you have an Airflow team where everyone's coming to you to get their Airflow requests done and you got to handle them all into much more of a self-service infrastructure where, you know, each team is managing their own workloads. Um, another big theme is that the community is only continuing to expand for Airflow. You have new projects coming out. You have new people becoming contributors to Airflow. Um, and so that's why I have that stock graph. It's only continuing to grow up and it's the speed of innovation within Airflow is only continuing. Um, and then finally, the modern data stack is Airflow. And so this is kind of overgeneralizing it, but really the theme I had is, you know, everyone who is running a modern data architecture is using Airflow to power that. It's using it to be able to hook into all the different systems that encompass that because Airflow is truly the only system that is flexible enough to adapt to all the different many varied use cases within the modern data ecosystem. Um, and so that is all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed. I hope to see you at the Airflow Summit next year. Um, and if I saw you at the Airflow Summit, it was great to see. I know I met some subscribers out there. Um, so anyways, have a good one. Data guy out.